Hello, good evening, Brooklyn. My name is Jason Gottlieb. I'm a, a lawyer, a partner at Morrison Cohen LLP, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. Jason, it's great to be here. I'm sure this is everyone's favorite panel, lawyers and regulators. <laughs> um, but I, I do have to give my disclaimer, which is that my views represent my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. I wish I could be there at, at DeFiCon in person, um, but thank you for having me virtually. It, uh, thank you. It's our pleasure, and it's really great to have you here. Now, we can all see you. I don't know if you can see us, but we can see you. You're up here on the on the big screen, so it's great to have you uh, with us here in Brooklyn. I will give my own disclaimer. Uh, my views are not the views of my clients, uh, just myself, uh, although if you want to uh, hold anything I say against the SEC, that, that's okay with me. Uh, Sorry, just joking. Uh, Commissioner Purse, let's let's just jump right into it with some basics. Uh, we're here at DeFiCon in New York. Uh, according to the tracking website DeFi Pulse, there's around $100 billion in total value locked in DeFi right now. And now that's small compared to the, the larger crypto market, which is somewhere around uh, you know, $2.25 or uh, $2.5 trillion. But it's large and it's getting larger. So we see a lot of space uh, growth in the space, and as you can see from the the crowd here, we've got a lot of intellectual interest in this space. Uh, as as one of the uh, commissioners of the Securities and Exchange Commission, I, I want to ask you just a foundational question about this space. So the the SEC's main goals are are really investor protection and market stability. How can we balance those goals with uh, the goal of respecting financial innovation in a fast developing space like this? Is, is that also a goal of the SEC? Well, so it's a good it's a good first question, I think, to start with this notion of what is the SEC actually trying to accomplish? And so our, our mission is threefold. We protect investors, facilitate capital formation and and, uh, and foster market integrity, which kind of gets to the stability point that you were mentioning. So nowhere in there is there an explicit mandate on us to think about the competitiveness of the United States or innovation. But I think that it really does factor into all of those prongs of our mission. Um, I think that we can't have a space that protects investors if we're not allowing for new ways to serve investors um, we can't have a stable market if we don't allow new entrants to come in and compete. So I think it does get laced into all of those decisions. Unfortunately, regulators tend to be fairly conservative when it comes to thinking about new things. And you know, we get comfortable with the way things are, we get comfortable with the actors we've been used to dealing with. Um, and so when something new comes, we're skeptical, which I think is, is healthy, skepticism is good. Um, but it, it, it's also important to remember that there's nothing in our mission that talks about merit regulation, meaning we don't have the authority to say no to a product because we don't like it um, or because we think it wouldn't be something that investors should like. Um, unfortunately, I, I think we do stray into merit regulation in some of the decisions that we make. Um, and so, so that can be really problematic. Thank you. That, that's a, a an interesting uh, perspective, and I think it's useful, uh, particularly to hear that the SEC is not, uh, or should not be, at least, uh, thinking about merit based regulation, uh, but instead, I, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, just about the the statutes and the regulations and and upholding what we have. Well, so ultimately, you know, we are a disclosure regulator. Our goal is to get information out there help people make decisions for themselves that work for themselves. Now, again, that's a pretty general statement. And there are certainly instances where we have much more specific mandates than that. So I don't I don't want to oversimplify it either. But um, really, when the SEC was created, its goal was not to make investment decisions for other people, which I think we would all find it to be a little troubling if the government decided how we should invest our hard earned money. I, I agree. I agree. Since we're here at a DeFi con, let's let's move into DAOs and talk about DAOs, you know, the, these decentralized autonomous organizations. And of course, that can have many, many meanings. Things can be more or less decentralized, more or less uh, autonomous and, and highly organized or not at all organized. Uh, let's talk about what that means. You know, when I think of decentralization, I'm thinking of of a widespread and dispersed 
user base interacting through a protocol, through smart contracts. Um, I'm thinking about dispersed development efforts and, and dispersed leadership, dispersed voting. Uh, the SEC uh, may have uh, views towards DAOs, uh, but let's let's talk more broadly uh, about the concepts here. So uh, we know that the SEC has reached one settlement uh, with a, a purportedly decentralized platform, the DeFi money market, and I believe you referred to it as a dino, decentralized in name only. Uh, is true decentralization possible? Uh, what, what do folks have to do to achieve it? And, and what effect would a true decentralization have under securities laws? I think questions about whether decentralization are possible are best answered by the, by the industry itself, by people actually building and developing. Um, you know, there are trade-offs to be made, right? If something is decentralized, it may not be as fast. Uh, it may not be uh, you know, you may decide you want to have a centralized something a little bit more centralized just for efficiency purposes. Um, but you know, then that you you're compromising security. So people are making these trade offs all the time. And I think one important thing is to recognize that those trade offs are being made. Um, second, I would say decentralization is not that doesn't that term doesn't appear in the securities laws as far as I'm aware. It's not something that we think about in the securities context, except we have been thinking about it, or at least I've been thinking about it, um, and, and others I think at the SEC have as well, in connection with the Howey test. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the Howey test, even non-lawyers, um, where we, we look to see whether something is a securities offering, a particular kind of securities offering an investment contract. We look at whether there's an investment of money with the expectation of profits based solely on the on the, the efforts of others. And it's that based solely on efforts of other prong that may then bring in this decentralization concept. So when I think of decentralization, I think of, okay, is this a system where if someone, any participant in that system got hit by a bus, that system would continue to operate without, you know, without a glitch there, you know, there, that no one participant is integral to the to the survival of that system. But as I was working on my Safe Harbor version 2.0, um, I, I I heard from a lot of people that they wanted some sort of help in thinking through what decentralization meant. So you mentioned, Jason, some of the things that I think are important. You look at governance, you look at development efforts, um, you look at network participation, those are the kinds of, of things you want to look at to understand whether something is decentralized. And I think you can kind of do a comparison too, right? When a project starts out, it's likely you're going to have a few people who are very actively involved in it. But over time, you get lots of people participating and those those initial people really don't have any information about the network that others participating don't have. Um, so you've kind of addressed the problem the securities laws are designed to go after, which is this information asymmetry problem. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it. But I should underscore that my views, you know, I gave the disclaimer at the beginning, and my views and my thinking on decentralization have not been endorsed by my colleagues. Uh, but I think it, it it is worth people in the space thinking about honestly and skeptically whether when you're calling yourselves decentralized you truly are now let me just say a word about DAOs because i think decentralized autonomous organizations are a really interesting potential um, way to organize human activity that's new and different um, and i think it's a really exciting area a lot of what happens with DAOs legally i think will be governed at state at the state level by state corporate law um, because in a way, a DAO is, is sort of a substitute for a corporation. And we at the federal level at the SEC, we're not supposed to really be governors of uh, corp corporations or corporate governance. Um, so so a lot of that, I think, will will be decided by others, by, by state regulators. Uh, well, Commissioner Peirce, you, you, you raise a very interesting issue here when we're talking about differences between uh, federal regulation and, and state regulation. And I want to complicate this just a little bit more by talking about uh, 
you know, international regulation or what we might call in a, in a, in a web three space, uh, a, a, a regulation of, of things that don't have borders, regulation of the internet. Uh, so just to be even uh, more nerdy uh, for uh, the folks in the audience here, uh, in, in 2010, the Supreme Court uh, decided in a case called Morrison versus National Australia Bank that the U.S. federal securities laws don't apply to purely offshore transactions. It's not touching the U.S. in any way. The federal securities laws don't apply. Uh, this got walked back a little bit more for fraud, so no, nobody should commit fraud ever. That's not legal advice, but really, come on, that's kind of legal advice. Don't commit fraud. Um, but but I want to talk a little bit about this this jurisdictional problem that you're talking about between uh, states and and federal regulations, but also regulation of of, of cyberspace. In a, in a decentralized world, users can be and often are from from anywhere and everywhere. How should we think about territorial jurisdiction on a decentralized blockchain where a transaction is going to happen on on every node of the blockchain anywhere in the world? Yeah, I mean, this is another very complicated topic, and I'm, I'm glad you're bringing in the the case law and 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 Dodd Frank, um, which tried to to uh, push back on the Supreme Court, um, well, or or restore the law to where where it was, uh, where where securities regulators had thought it was. So the bottom line, though, is that if you are doing something. Either you're you're sitting in the United States and you're doing something, or you're sitting abroad and you're doing something that then has effects in the United States. You ought to be thinking about U.S. securities laws. So that in in our modern world means that someone who doesn't has never thought about the SEC might inadvertently be implicating the SEC, um, even though the person's never been to the United States. So. Bottom line is it's very it's a very broad test and and making it even more broad is that um, our chair chair Gansler he he takes tends to take a broad view of of jurisdiction. Um, I think about the time when he was at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission as chairman there, and one of his colleagues, Commissioner Jill Summers, said that he was applying an intergalactic commerce clause. Um, <laughs> because he took such a broad view of, of how the CFTC's rules should apply. And so I, I would caution people that I expect that that will be a similar um, approach. And in fact, I think my colleagues, even before Chair Gensler got there, sometimes took a different view of how broad the reach of our rules should be. I tend to, to think that if, if very little of the activity is happening in the United States, and very little of the effects are happening in the United States. It's not a great use of, my, of our resources as regulators to be focused on that. Um, I would rather there's so much happening in the U.S. I'd rather focus domestically. So now, again, I'm not giving legal advice either, but I think a lot of people are now taking the position that they don't even want to deal with the ambiguity of U.S. law. So they're putting. They're they're making concerted efforts to avoid having U.S. participants in their in their projects. Um, that means you know putting up statements saying if you're a U.S. person, just stay away from us. We don't want you trying to engage in geo blocking and that sort of thing as well. Um, you know, half-hearted attempts will see through those. I can warn you that you know it's not enough just to put up a a, a statement and then very clearly allow people who have us who are us persons to participate uh it is it is really an area where if the if the sec wants to find us contacts it's usually not that hard yes thank you and and i i, I completely agree with that you see some folks uh you know saying we don't want us users and then they walk right into their telegram or their discord and say okay us users here's how you use a vpn to avoid the, the don't do that come on guys but but to be but to be more specific about the the technical aspects here I and mean, we've seen players as, as you said players are avoiding the us because of the regulatory uncertainty in, in large part but there, there may be technological limitations to doing that so developers can geofence their their front ends uh, that they can centrally control. But if you are launching a true DeFi protocol, you launch it onto the internet, 
and anyone can use it and it's permissionless, it may not be technically possible to build that sort of, of geofencing in to any any degree of certainty, much less 100% degree of certainty. What what do you think about the, the technological limitations or, or capabilities of, of geofencing and VPN blocking? What ramifications does that have under the securities laws? Well, I think that you're right to point that out. That's one of the things that makes it so so difficult to avoid U.S. jurisdiction, that um, these technological efforts can be circumvented. Um, as you said, people who are developers sh certainly shouldn't assist people in circumventing them because that's clearly going to uh, attract the interest of, of U.S. regulators. Um, but, you know, it, it is very difficult to do. And I mean, with respect to when you when you launch a, a, a protocol and you put it out there um, and then you, you don't have control over it anymore, that raises bigger issues about who we're going to go after if someone uses a, a DeFi protocol to do something that we don't like or that we think should only be done in a specific way. Um, I think that's a bigger question than just uh, one around the technology around geo geofencing. Well, well, that is an interesting question. Uh, maybe if you could add some further detail on that. I mean, you could easily imagine, uh, you know, somebody creating a system and letting it loose on the world. And if that system clearly only has, uh, you know, illegal or violative means, uh, regulators or, or other law enforcement, they're, they're not going to uh, sit there and let it alone, right? If I created a uh, murder machine killbot, let it loose on the streets of Brooklyn, and somebody arrested me, and I said, well, I'm not doing it. The machine is killing people. No, you know, that, that's not going to fly. But how do we think about uh, protocols that have uh, uses that are both completely legal and legitimate, but also could be misused for things that would violate the securities laws, and then they're released onto the internet, they're put out there. Uh, we know to a certain limit, uh, there's a First Amendment right to uh, write and publish software, but of course there's no First Amendment right to violate the securities laws. H how, how do we resolve this tension? What do you think about that? Well, I think it is a tension that we really need to be talking about and thinking about as a society. And I'm, I, what I'm concerned about is that people are are not um, spending enough time talking about it now before it becomes a real issue. I personally think it's very important that we that we we protect the First Amendment, uh, that we protect that in the context of software development too. It's it's. Um, you know, I've had people suggest, well, the regulator should approve software before it goes live. That really gives me great concern because one, uh, you know, I've seen how how it's worked for the for for regulators to approve other things. It takes a long time, may not happen. But two, it, it's just this notion that someone's creative ability is going to be constrained by a regulatory uh, door that you have to walk through is is very troubling to me, and I think it has real really broad implications. But I think there are a lot of people who feel very comfortable with the idea that software developers should be held responsible for what people end up doing with their software. And, uh, you know, again, let's have a broader conversation about that as a society, because this is go going to be a very live issue, I think, very soon, given the ability of people to build things, put them out there, and then they can they can become very widely used very quickly, as we've seen in this space. Um, I don't have I don't have comfort to offer you right now because I think a lot of people take a broader view of this than I do. I appreciate that. Thank you. So to to switch gears just a little bit, we we've, we've talked about the the Howey test uh, because you know we're we're two lawyers up here and you you can't go five minutes in this space uh, talking to a lawyer without hearing about the Howey test. Uh, but there's another Supreme Court test that is potentially relevant to some of the operations of, of DeFi protocols, the Reeves test, a, a Supreme Court case from 1990 called Reeves ver versus Ernst & Young that talks about when, when a note is a security or when a lending could be a security as well. There's a lot of uh, case law and guidance under the Howey test, but, uh, but in, in my view, there's a little less under Reeves. 
And as far as I'm aware, there's none that talks about how that would be applied in the context of uh, DeFi protocols that are uh, of the stake and, and staking and lending ilk. Uh, are, are loans to or from a, a true DeFi protocol uh, going to be a, a security under Reeves if a, if a transaction is indefinite, non-custodial, and peer-to-protocol, et cetera? Is there a way that we should be thinking about these things? Well, I'm going to hide a little bit behind the, the lawyer um, shield there and say facts and circumstances matter. But it is um, it is true that now it's it's like lesson two for the crypto world. It's we've moved past Howie and now we're thinking about Reeves and this idea of of notes. And and this this is a result of the fact that the definition of security is a really broad one. Investment contracts are one piece of that. Notes are another piece of that. There's a presumption that a note would be a security, um, but there's some things that Reeves has told us we need to look at. You've got to look at the purpose of the note. You look at you know what people's expectations are around it, how it's being distributed. Um, and I think importantly in this space, you look at whether there's a regulatory framework, a, another regulatory framework other than the SEC. And if there is, it's likely that you know it, it'll be outside of the SEC's reach. But if there isn't another regulatory framework, it's it's uh, you know it can be can be very likely that the securities laws will extend to those to those notes. So I'm not going to answer your specific question. I'm going to say though it's something you really need to be thinking about with with likely with the help of counsel who are experienced in securities laws type issues because this can be a very difficult area. I mean, now there's another question, which is which is one that I like to ask in this space, which is even if the securities laws should do apply, the question is, should they apply? And I tend to be someone who thinks, you know, look, if two people voluntarily agree to enter in, into a transaction, um, the presumption should not be that that the government needs to prevent that transaction from happening. Um, but we do have securities laws that are in place now. And so, so you've got to confront and deal with those. And then you can raise the broader questions of should there be certain places where the securities laws don't apply the way they do in other places? And, and is, there, is there a way that people can sort of opt into a less regulated framework? Maybe that's something we want as a society. Um, but but you've got to, you know, first tackle the, the laws as, as they're written. Well, I think you're, you're raising an interesting point, and, and it's one that you've uh, spoken about repeatedly tonight, which is having these broader conversations and thinking about the frameworks that we're, that we're working within. So all these frameworks start with statutes, right? For the Securities and Exchange Commission, you're looking at, at the uh, Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, the Securities Act of 1933, uh, the, the Investment Company and Investment Advisor Act of 1940, a whole bunch of regulations, but all of these statutes are written by Congress. Uh, this week we had here hearings in both houses of Congress about crypto, DeFi, and stable coins. And uh, you know, without, without naming any names, uh, some of the politicians seem more friendly to the innovation in this space. Some seem neutral but curious. Some seem downright hostile. Uh, given that uh, Congress is going to pass the legislation uh, that the SEC then would have to administer and enforce, uh, if if you uh, and again for yourself individually, if there were any kind of uh, new legislation uh, approaching this space, the DeFi space, the crypto space, what would you like to see uh, Congress move toward? Well, before I get there, I want to just address a couple of the comments that that I've seen here uh, on the sidebar. And one is, you know, it says, look, the bigger issue is U.S. citizens are being left out, which is bad and often hypocritical. And and I agree with that concern. I mean, that's that's been a concern that I've expressed to my colleagues, which is, you know, it's all well and good for us to say, well, we just it's easier for us if you just shut U.S. persons out, because then we don't have to worry about regulating it. And U.S. and U.S. persons are then protected. But I mean, that that totally misses the point that there's an opportunity cost to shutting them out. So I, I certainly agree with that. And that's why I think we need to do a better job getting, getting the laws straight in the US. And then another comment, which I thought was a fabulous point is that DAOs and government, governance tokens have built in regulation. Does that mean it's outside the SEC's reach? So when I say another regulatory framework, I should have been more clear on that, that it, 
means you know another government regulatory framework. But I love the point that the commenter is making, which is that DeFi does have um, other types of governance and regulatory mechanisms. And so what I'd like us to do, again, as a society, sit down and say, all right, we're trying to achieve particular regulatory objectives. But if the technology has an inherent way to achieve some of those objectives, transparency, the fact that everyone's participating on the same terms, the fact that you can take a look at the smart, at the at the code um, ahead of time to understand how it will operate. Um, those are things that traditional traditional finance doesn't have. The fact that there's no intermediary to treat one set of of people different than another set of people. Um, there there aren't the kinds of information asymmetries you see elsewhere. Um, there aren't the kinds of conflicts perhaps that you see elsewhere either. And so. I think those are very relevant points, and that's why I think it is. And Jason, this is a very long way of getting to your question. It would be nice to see Congress saying, hey, let's take a look at this technology. Let's look at its unique attributes that maybe make it necessary for there to be a different style of regulation. Um, I would love to see that happen. I think, as, as you mentioned, there were hearings just just last week um, on crypto, and I think some of those hearings were were you know indicated that people in Congress are are, are spending more time thinking about these issues or getting their arms around them. But Congress can be very um, it, you know it's very hard to get stuff through Congress. We all know that uh, there are members on both sides of the aisle who are really interested in this, in the promise of this technology. I think we've seen a number of different types of bills that people have introduced. Um, I was pleased to see recently um, the inclusion of the safe harbor that I mentioned earlier that was included in, in some legislation that that ranking member in, of the House Financial Services Committee, McHenry, introduced. Um, you know, we can do a lot at the SEC using our exemptive authority, which, which means that when when Congress wrote the security statutes, they said, we understand that things are going to change over time. And so we're going to give you pretty broad power to let people um, experiment. But we have to actually take affirmative steps to allow people to do that, which we haven't done so far. And then I think there are bigger questions around who should be responsible, if anyone, for regulating different aspects of the crypto um, environment. And, and it would be good to have Congress um, help us think think through those issues because if Congress doesn't step in, what is likely going to happen, and I think we're seeing this already, there's a jockeying for position among existing regulators. Um, and one way to assert control over an area is to start bringing enforcement actions in that area. Um, and so it could become that we end up with a, a de facto allocation of, of regulatory authority based on who gets there first with an enforcement action. So there's room for Congress to act. I understand they've got a lot of other things on their plate too. And, and it is certainly above my pay grade what Congress does. I'm not advocating any particular piece of legislation, um, but I think some of these these issues are bigger societal issues. And, and sometimes those issues are better thought through at the congressional level where there's direct representation rather than at the uh, regulatory level where um, there's, there's indirect political accountability. You mentioned in your answer, and you've mentioned uh, previously tonight, uh, your idea for a safe harbor. Uh, you, you'd said a, a, a 2.0. There was a, a 1.0, of course. Now we're at 2.0. For those in the audience who aren't familiar with with your proposal for a safe harbor and the, the reasoning behind it, maybe you could uh, discuss that for us a little bit. So the, the idea behind the safe harbor was to address this problem, which, which seems to me to exist, which is when a, a a group of developers sits down and they develop a they 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 want to develop a network they want to they want to launch a token um, they've done a lot of work to get it ready to go they're ready to launch they want to have wide participation um, on that network at that point can you do can you launch without implicating the securities laws and I think the, these as we've seen with with a number of enforcement actions over the past several years this can be a very difficult and tricky area. So what I thought to do is, is to, to address the concern that people have, which is that buyers of these tokens 
aren't getting the information they need to know what it is they're buying. They don't know who the team is. They don't know what the plans are. They don't know what the token economics are. Um, they don't get updates as the project is being developed. And so the idea was to say, all right, let's have some targeted disclosures that are relevant in this area. Um, and, and then at the end of a three-year period, you, your hope and your goal is that the network is decentralized enough that there's no party that can make those disclosures anymore because there isn't an information asymmetry. The disclosures that would be that would be made under the safe harbor would be backed up by the, the anti-fraud laws under the securities laws. So you would be opting in to be subject to the anti-fraud laws if you took advantage of it. But it would give you a three-year runway to, to get broader public participation. And I think it would achieve the objective of informing buyers about what they're buying. Thank you. It makes a, it makes a lot of sense to give people a, a chance to develop and decentralize. You know, it, it, there is no project that's decentralized uh, from day one, or at least right before day one, because some person, some human being, created it and put it out there. And maybe if it is decentralized on day one, somebody creates it, puts it out there, and walks away. Uh, you know, a la Satoshi with with Bitcoin, that can be one thing. But uh, a lot of projects take some time. So, so I think the safe harbor proposal of yours would give projects time to get where they're going, and I, I think that that would be a very good idea. Uh, let's talk about uh, some advice uh, that that you may have uh, for market participants who are dealing with this regulatory thicket. Uh, you mentioned before you know, you, uh, that, that, that there were a lot of facts and circumstances tests in the law. Uh, you you describe that as sort of hiding behind being a lawyer, but but that's just you know life in the law. Uh, some folks have said, some of your colleagues have said that if you're asking a lawyer, accountant, or advisor if something is over the line. Maybe it's time to step back from the line. But given the, that these facts and circumstances tests are strewn throughout the law, uh, particularly in new areas like decentralized finance, how can people in the space uh, conduct themselves in a regulatory compliant way with, with confidence? I mean, I think they can't right now. And I think that's that's exactly the problem. And I, I hear from you from, well, your colleagues, at least lawyers uh, who are who are helping people in this space who say, you know, you're not you SEC aren't doing us any favors because when people come to us, we can't give them clear lines. We have to tell them, you know, everything is is opaque. And so it I think it's it's really problematic. And I actually find it problematic when you say, well, if, if, you know, if you don't know if you're, you're over the line, you ought to step back from the line. Well, I mean, the line is supposed to be a clear line that if you step across it, you're in the world of illegal behavior. If you're on the other side of it, you're not. And there's no obligation for you to step far away from the line. That's ridiculous. That, that then prevents people from doing things, right? Because they're always living in fear that they're, they're tripping over this, this unclear line that that we don't lay down and and so someone described it to me recently and i really thought this was a good way of putting it as strategic ambiguity on the part of of us the regulator if we keep things so open-ended that no one's quite sure whether or not you're you're breaking the law then people are are constantly well either they're avoiding the us as we've talked about or they're just constantly living in fear that that they're going to be the next example of an enforcement action and that it, it's just it's not a good way to foster innovation and entrepreneurship and and it's the last thing i want is for people who are developing stuff in this space to be spending half of their time thinking about the the regulatory framework they should be able to go talk to a lawyer get some parameters around what they should be thinking about and then go off and 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 develop stuff um you know i'm seeing some frustration again in the comments um about about you know why is it that the that the government can tell us not not to do things online and and why why should why should that be happening in a free country and and look i i very much sympathize with with the frustrations that i'm sure some of you feel because again if if people are undertaking voluntary actions where no one's co coercing them to do anything i think the presumption from a regulatory point of view should be that that's okay, that you can do that as long as it doesn't have adverse effects on someone outside of that transaction. Um, 
you know, again, we're talking about adults here who are who are voluntarily and knowingly entering into into something, but that isn't how the law is is written. And so, um, I I certainly approach my job as a regulator, and I think, all right, if we have a mandate to do something, then I have to follow the mandate because that's what Congress told me to do. But if this is an open area where we're deciding to put a regulation in place. One of the things that I think about is, well, first of all, why should we be telling people not to do something that they have a right to do? The individual's freedom and liberty to engage in transactions is, is of real importance to me. And I think too often that is left out of the regulatory calculus altogether. And we don't think about the fact that when we put a rule in place that tells you how to do something or tells you you can't do something, we've taken something away from people. That is part of our investor protection mission to think about what we're taking away from people. So totally get the uh, frustration that you feel. I, I wish I had had better better answers for you, but you know, again, participate in in these broader societal conversations. Talk to me. Talk to other regulators um, about what what you think we should be doing, what we're getting wrong, what we're getting right. I have a couple more questions, but I would I would love to hear either from the audience. I, I see you're seeing comments in a sidebar. I'm 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 uh, sitting alone on the stage, so I don't see the sidebar. If you want to take any question you want from there, that's fine. I, I, otherwise, I'd love to take a question from the audience. I've got one right here. You, why, don't, why don't you just shout it out and then I'll repeat it. So I, I don't know if you could hear the question. Could you hear it? Okay. So I'll I'll, I'll try to do it justice and forgive me if I if I don't. Uh, looking at your uh, safe harbor, Commissioner Purse, and and other uh, proposals that you've made, uh, to, how does that fit in with the securities laws as we have it? And to what extent can uh, developers uh, use those proposals or rely on them as they're uh, thinking about developing their projects? Okay, so I'm very glad you asked that question because I'll say don't rely on the safe harbor um, because it's my proposal that I put out there. I was hoping that I could talk my colleagues into it. One of my colleagues, uh, Commissioner Crenshaw, recently addressed the proposal and said she thought it would have made um, 2017 even worse if it had been in place. So I think that is not an endorsement of my safe harbor. And so, so far, um, I, I have not been successful at selling it to my colleagues until it actually gets adopted um, by the commission, you can't rely on it. Um, it and we, we could adopt something like this. It would be a little bit unusual, but not, not out of the realm of what we do. Because as I mentioned, we do have the ability to, to write exemptions. And this would be an exemption essentially. And so it, it would be possible for us to do, but we haven't done it yet, so don't rely on it. Um, another question that came in in the chat was was what kind of collaboration is there amongst federal agencies? There's certainly um, a lot of visible infighting among those agencies. That said, there is quite a bit of collaboration, both domestically and internationally, among regulators around crypto. Now, sometimes I worry about that collaboration, and the reason I worry is that you put a bunch of regulators in the room and you you set them to talk about some new technology and they're all going to just spin each other up with their fears about the bad stuff and not you know not remember that they're they're good aspects too and i think especially this is problematic in the united states where our financial system functions relatively well for a lot of people and so you forget that their real values uh, there's real value and people are already using this technology in a lot of places and it really has changed people's lives and those stories just don't filter themselves into those discussions among regulators. But that said, I do think it's positive that regulators are speaking with one another um, because there is a really complicated regulatory framework in the U.S. and it is important to have collaboration. I've called for us to 
to work with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I would love for us to have a roundtable where we can discuss some of these issues. Um, I think any kind of collaboration like that is is helpful and good. Do we have another question right here? So the, the, the question is uh, springing off the uh, platform of uh, talking about DAOs under state law, how can we think about DAOs uh, under federal law and particularly insofar as they are allowing uh, people who are not accredited investors to take part in, in finance and, and uh, financial transactions that uh, previously may only have been available or largely only available to accredited investors? Again, I'm trying to do justice to the question. Okay, well, that's a, it's kind of a hard question. I, I think one piece of that is how does state law interact with federal law? And I, I think there's still a lot of questions around, you know, what that, how that will work. I think what some states are trying to do, like Wyoming, they're trying to create a model, a legal model that works for DAOs. And then once that happens, presumably that can slot into um, the federal regulatory structure, but it's still it's still, I think, TBD, how that's going to actually work. Um, so that's that's very much still developing. In terms of the on the accredited investor threshold, and I guess the idea is that you'd have a DAO that could buy things, even if its individual members were not accredited, um, accredited investors. I, I mean, that is something that happens already you can have an investor in a mutual fund who's not accredited but the mutual fund is purchasing things that only accredited investors can buy because the 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 fund itself is is counts as accredited so so there there certainly is a model for that kind of thing um, but again we you know we're we're dealing i think with a with regulators who are not necessarily looking for ways to make it easier for for a group of of unaccredited investors to get together and, and buy things so um i'm not you know i'm again not giving legal advice uh but but suggesting that and then i'll, I'll just say someone asked what the what the one piece of legislation is that's likely to to change things for uh you know to allow greater participation by u.s investors in nfts or DeFi, um i think was the question and I, I i don't know that i can point to one piece of legislation there are a lot of pieces of legislation that are floating around out there and it's worth your taking a look at them although i will say that nfts are not as far as i've seen nfts haven't gotten a lot of legislative attention yet um i think we're still uh we're still working on the definition of security there and another point I think that's a great point is that it's not surprising that the U.S. is a bit slow at um, at regulating because, you know, regulators tend to be slow. Smaller jurisdictions can be more nimble. I think we've certainly seen that play out in the um, crypto space where smaller jurisdictions have said, hey, we think this is this is really good technology and we're going to figure out a way how to write to, to, to rewrite our laws in order to allow it to flourish here. Um, and then I think there's another point in the chat that came through, which is you do have to you do have to be careful about how you think about regulation because it is slow. The idea is to keep it as broad and technology neutral as possible. But I'm always finding a little bit of a clash with, you know, the idea of keeping it technology neutral, which I think is really important, but also allowing it the flexibility to um, accommodate new technologies. And so. Uh, any help that you all can give me in finding that line is is great. We have another question here in the audience. Uh, so we do 
So the, the question is, uh, you know, thank you for uh, being a, a champion for the space. Uh, as we see people building in the space in, in a Web3 metaverse kind of world uh, where people are building some, some truly imaginative things, uh, what, are some thing, what are some ways that we can work together to develop uh, regulation in the space? Well, I mean, I think you all, because you know the technology the best and you know what people are building and you know where the pain points are, you can certainly let me know what, where the pain points, you know, after talking to your lawyers, figure out where the pain points are, let me know, let me know where they are. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing stopping anyone from saying, here's how we think the rules should be rewritten. Um, people, we've seen a number of, of, of regulatory frameworks being thrown out there by, by bigger centralized participants in this space, um, you know, individuals can can participate too. And I, I, I like to underscore that we are the, the regulator, you know, we, we belong to you, it doesn't work, it's not the other way around. And so um, help us to understand what you're trying to build, help us to, to think about a more uh, a healthier approach to regulation. And, and so don't hesitate to reach out to your regulators. Um, they're, you know, they, you have as much right to access your regulator as anyone else does. So, so you know, you should feel free to take advantage of that. We have an office of financial innovation, the FinHub, which if you have questions about a particular project, you can go to them and you can, you can, uh, you know, describe what you're trying to do. Now, I should underscore that th this, you know, mixed message of, hey, come in and talk to us. And if you come in and talk to us, you can wait five years and, um, you might not have an answer yet. It's a difficult, it, it, this is really problematic. And this is one of the things that, that I'm particularly frustrated about. Uh, thank you. I think there are a lot of us that uh, share that frustration. Well, one more question here from the audience. Are there any crypto brokerage rules that, that are there any crypto brokerage rules that the infrastructure bill got right? Well, I'm going to, I don't, Jason, do you want to answer that question? Because, because again, I, I you know, I, I, I should probably hour for stay that. away. <laughs> I should probably <laughs> stay away from, from critiquing a particular legislation. Um, but Jason, I don't know if you have any quick thoughts on uh, Quick thoughts? No, I'm a lawyer. I don't really have quick thoughts. I'll, I'll I'll ask you a question. I'll, I'll I'll change things up just a little bit. We we've heard about NFTs and and we had a, a great uh, NFT panel on right before this. You know the way I think about the the interlay of of NFTs and securities laws. A, a straight NFT, if it's just an F, NFT of a piece of art and it is sold, it's maybe five percent blockchain law and ninety five percent IP law. Uh, who has the rights to that? image how are you conveying the rights to that image it's it's not really a securities law problem but when you start implicating the securities laws are when you are taking a group of nfts and fractionalizing them or when people are investing in nfts as a way to raise money and and as you said commissioner purse people are are looking to nfts uh, with the expectation of profit from others uh, can you can you share if you have thoughts about the overlay of securities laws on nfts well, I think you've you've uh, highlighted a couple places where people should be careful. I expect that NFTs, which are still really in their infancy, and I think people are trying to figure out different ways, different use cases for NFTs. I suspect that some of those use cases are going to are going to directly implicate the securities laws, even you know on the non fractionalized uh, on a non fractionalized basis, right? Because if you if you decide that you're trying to take a security and turn it into an NFT, then that certainly implicates the securities laws. Um, and this is this is certainly an area where I think we should be providing some guidance. So again, if people have particular questions, it's helpful for me to at least collect those questions. I don't know how successful I'll be at getting guidance out the door. Um, so far, we've really provided limited guidance. Most of it has been in the form of investor alerts or things like that, where we tell people, you know, be careful not to buy stuff just because celebrities are hawking it, um, which 
you know, is definitely good advice. Um, but we haven't really answered some of these more in the weeds questions. And part of the reason is just because things are changing so fast. And that's why the calls for education in the comments, I fully am on board with those. I know that from my perspective, trying to keep on top of what's happening in crypto is, is, is virtually impossible given all the other responsibilities I have. I love to learn about this space. And so if there's ever something you think that I really need to see, hear, read, whatever, you should, you should tell me about it. Um, but anything that, that you all can do to make it easier for us as regulators to figure out what's going on and, and what we need to be providing guidance on, that's, that's really useful for us. So, um, so please do that. I know talking to regulators is not always at the top of your list. The, the pace of development in crypto reminds me of uh, a quote from the, the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland. We have to run as fast as we can just to stay in place. We've got, speaking of time, we've got time for one more question, if you'll indulge us. So we'll do one question and then we'll let you go. It's a great question. So uh, the, the, the question, Commissioner Purse, is when we're talking about strategic ambiguities and line drawings, we saw one uh, exercise in line drawing back in the summer of 2017 with the SEC's Dow report. Uh, what uh, line drawing could there be uh, or should there be uh, with regards to the, the next iteration of what we're seeing in the DeFi space? Well, so the Dow report, I think, was helpful, although I I wasn't at the SEC at the time. I I, I don't think it was actually the best example of, a, of an ICO to use to, to try to draw that line. Um, more generally, I don't think it's good to use that wasn't that was kind of a quasi enforcement way of drawing the line. I think it's far better. One thing, I guess, to, to help people give people context. The SEC is is a regulatory agency first and foremost, and most of most of what we do is we write rules, and then we have a set of people who go out. They examine firms that are registered with us, like investment advisors, broker dealers, the stock exchanges, um, to make sure they're complying with those rules. And then enforcement is kind of the last stop, right? If if people are not complying, then enforcement goes in um, and and brings a case. But in general, what we need to do is we need to be putting out guidance in the form of, I think, more proactive kind of guidance. Like, here's what we're seeing in the space, and you might want to consider these things. And so, I would say crypto lending is one of those examples. Um, decentralized exchanges is another example where I think we could do that around NFTs, which we've just been talking about. That's another area where I think it would be helpful for us to say, hey, you know, these are some of the things you might want to be thinking about. It, we, we have a system where a lot of that kind of guidance comes out from the staff of the SEC, which means it doesn't have the force of the commission speaking. So to the extent we can provide that guidance at the commission level where, where then you really can rely on it um, in a way that you can't when it just comes out of the staff, I think that would be that would be ideal. Um, but you know, so far, my colleagues have been very content at taking a backward looking, we'll tell you what the law is. And, and again, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus and I, 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 I don't, that's not my intent, but I don't think it's helpful to take uh, an enforcement first approach that is not consistent with with how Congress designed our agency. Thank you very much. I, please, everyone, give a warm hand to Commissioner Hester Purse of the Securities Exchange Commission. Thank you very much for being here with us in Brooklyn, virtually. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for having me, and my door is always open. Thank you. Me? Uh, my name is Jason Godley. Thank you very much.